South Wales Bar in 2011 and is a member of the Queen Square Chambers. Uh, Sandrine has a background in both common law, Australia and the United Kingdom, and civil law in France, with a master's level qualifications under both systems, including an LLM in commercial law from the University of New South Wales. Prior to moving to Australia, Sandrine worked for two years as a legal officer at the Hague Conference on Private International Law and the International Family Law and Protection of Children team. She was a member of the drafting committee of the Hague Convention of 23 November 2007 on the international recovery of child support and other forms of family maintenance and the Hague Protocol of 23 November 2007 on the law applicable to maintenance obligations. In Australia, prior to being called to the bar, uh, Ms. Alexander Hughes worked for top tier law firms in litigation and international arbitration. In her practice at the bar, Ms. Alexander Hughes has been uh, specialising in conflict of laws and cross-border enforcement issues, whether applied to family, succession or commercial matters. She is also undertaking a part-time PhD at the University of Sydney, researching the treatment of foreign anti-nuptial agreements in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Sandrine Alexander. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm reassured, I'm tall enough, you can see my head. I've been wondering about this all morning, so I can see you and I hope you can see me. Um, I'm very grateful to have been invited to speak today, and uh, as mentioned previously, I was a legal officer at the Permanent Bureau of the Hague Conference for two years before moving to Australia. Um, as mentioned also, um, amongst other UTs, I was privileged to be um, a member of the drafting committee for the um, 2007 Convention on the International Recovery of Spousal Migrants and Child Support. Um, being involved in this convention triggered some of the best memories in my personal and um, professional life. First, as mentioned by David, this is when we met. Um, second, I think maybe it's all downhill from there from a professional point of view as well because my best professional memory was um, the very night we put the final word on the convention, uh, driving my bike back home at 3 a.m. and I was overfilled with joy. <laughs> um, <coughs> since the day after that night, um, the day the convention was signed by all the members and signed by <coughs> the United States of America, who was the first country to sign the convention, I've been monitoring the progresses of the convention and I'm delighted to see that it entered into force and that now 34 countries are contracting parties. Um, to the best of my recollection at the time, um, Australia was a very active member in the working group and took a fair part in the lead of the negotiations and the research. So I'm still waiting for Australia to ratify this convention. <laughs> now when I left the permanent bureau, when I left The Hague to come to Australia, what I really wanted to see is how the, the conventions I had been working on would operate in practice and how I could use them in the courtroom. So <coughs> I took the bar exam here in New South Wales and um, after a couple of years in practice, um, I can give you a bit of feedback about how these conventions um, work um, in Australia and um, how they are useful from a practical point of view in an international practice. So, I won't focus on the case law, um, rather I will um, focus about how in your legal practice um, these conventions can enable your clients to avoid spending too much time and legal fees in the courtroom. So we'll be dealing with a selection of conventions. Um, first of all, um, the 1980 Convention on International Child Abduction. Second, I will address the 1996 Convention on the jurisdiction applicable law, recognition, enforcement, and cooperation in respect of parental responsibility and measures for the protection of children. It sounds like a very long and scary title, but actually it's a very useful convention. And if you take it step by step, it's, it's very simple to understand how it works. And the last convention I will be dealing with um, is the Convention of 1961 on the conflict of laws relating to the form of testamentary dispositions. Um, all the examples but one are derived from my practice. Um, 
they didn't all reach the stage of final hearings because the reality of practice is that matters do settle. But even from a purely advisory perspective, it is great for the client to have the legal certainty and clarity brought to their situation by, by the Hague Conventions. <coughs> um, so first of all, um, the 1980 Convention on International Child Abduction. Um, most of you in the room would be familiar with the mechanisms of the Convention, so I will just give a very <coughs> broad overview of the mechanisms. The objective of the Convention is to provide a swift return um, of the child who has abducted from one parent, from country A to country B. Um, if all the conditions imposed by the conventions are fulfilled, then um, there is no other choice for the judge hearing the matter, subject to a few exceptions that are actually quite complex, uh, but to return uh, the child to his or her country of habitual residence. <coughs> and the efficiency of this mechanism also acts as a deterrent for parents who are contemplating abducting their children. <coughs> so the convention brings both legal certainty to a matter and also practical assistance and as the cooperation part of the Hague Conference work so in terms of legal certainty, the return mechanism and obligation applies if a couple of conditions are fulfilled. First, the child has to be habitually resident in the country he was uh, abducted from. So the child has to be habitually resident in country A. Second, the abduction or retention must occur in breach of the custody or parental rights of the left behind parents. And third, this left behind parent uh, must have been actually exercising those rights. Um, and finally, quite obviously, country A and country B must be state parties to the convention. Um, the cooperation mechanism, which is the practical assistance um, offered by the convention to the left behind parent, um, is a cooperation mechanism through a system of central authorities. So each country um, member to the convention will have a central authority under that convention. So practically what happens is that the left behind parents living in country A will contact the central authority of country A and if the conditions are fulfilled then the central authority of country A will contact the central authority of country B and in country B which might be the other side of the world, like Australia, from a European or US perspective, in country B, the central authority will commence proceedings against the abducting parents. So the practical advantages for the um, left behind parents are quite considerable. In Australia, the legislation implementing the convention is section 111B of the Familial Act and the Familial Child Abduction Convention regulations 1996. To date, uh, as mentioned by Christophe, this convention has 95 um, contracting states. So <coughs> I'm going to take you through a brief um, case study that is derived from my practice. Uh, actually, I have decided not to take a case where the convention applies because the benefits are self-explanatory. Rather, I'm going to contrast the practical um, assistance that I've just described offered by the convention with what happens when the convention doesn't apply. So in, in my case, um, country A was Japan and the convention didn't apply because at the time of the fact Japan was not a party to the convention and country B was Australia. Um, the mother was Australian and the father was French and they both lived in Japan. Um, so it sounds like a case study from many, but these things do really happen in practice and that's my whole point today. Um, so both parents lived in Japan and the father had greatly sacrificed his career for the benefit of the mother's career. Um, so he earned, he earned little or almost no income in Japan. And uh, when one weekend the mother adopted their baby to Australia, where she filed parenting proceedings as in a domestic case as if she'd been living in Australia the whole time. So the father is left in Japan with no wife, no babies, no baby, um, no child. So this sounds maybe ridiculous and maybe trivial in theory, but in practice, this guy had to pack the whole house 
and pay for the shipment of everything back to France or Australia. And, and he had no further reason to live in Japan. And then he temporarily, move, temporarily moves to Australia to seek legal advice and attend the first school date. Um, the father had to find a way to finance his traveling and the court proceedings and staying in Australia. Um, he couldn't extend his stay to Australia for long as he was only eligible for a tourist visa under which he had to exit Australia every three months. Uh, fully litigated parenting proceedings in Australia, at first instance only, at the moment take between 12 and 18 months. So that means that the father would have had to fly back to France to live with his family and find a job, and then fl fly back to Australia for interim and final hearing. Um, and this type of situation being separated from the child for a year to a year and a half also impacts on the child-father relationship and the final outcome of the proceedings. So this is to be contrasted with the father being able to, if country A was a party under the convention, just remain where it was and, and go through a channel of the central authorities. Um, the story behind that case is very unusual. Um, the matter settled. For the best outcome that could have been reached at the time, and even more unusual, uh, not taking that for granted, a year after the parents reconciled, and now they're all living happily, as far as I know, in Australia. But um, that's that's a nice side to this story, but sadly, this is very, very uncommon. Um, the second convention I wanted to mention today is the one with a terrifying title, but if you take it one step at a time, it's very easy. So this convention has a very broad scope and is known under its short title as the International Protection of Children Convention. Uh, it deals with matters such as uh, parental responsibility, contact or time spent with, as we say in Australia, measures of care and protection, representation, and protection of the child's property. So it's an extremely, extremely useful convention um, in practice. Um, as the title indicates, the convention will identify for you which, country, which country's authorities, and this can be administrative or judicial, depending on the countries and the system, which authorities have jurisdiction to take decisions um, relevant to a child in an international setting of facts. So I, I get to that in a minute in practice. Um, the principle set out by the convention is that um, the, the authorities which have um, jurisdiction to hear the matter are the authorities of the country in which the child has his or her habitual residence, so it's pretty straightforward. Second, once you know where the matter is going to be heard, the convention tells you what law is going to be applied by the authorities hearing the matter. And usually that's the law of the forum, the place where um, the matter is heard, uh, subject to um, a few exceptions. Once the decision is taken, uh, the convention also provides for a mechanism of recognition and enforcement of this decision in contracting states. In Australia, the legislation implementing this convention is part 13 AA Division 4 of the Family Law Act and um, the Family Law Child Protection Convention Regulations 2003. And to date, this convention has 44 contracting states so let me take you to um, two case studies. But what is really interesting about this convention is that it looks after the person of the child, but also the property of the child. And um, the, the second one is also um, an issue that is becoming uh, increasingly relevant these days. Um, so case one is not derived from my practice also, although I've got a case coming, but it's a very um, typical um, example to show how the convention works. <coughs> so for example, a child lives with his mother in Australia and the father lives in a foreign jurisdiction. Um, a dispute arises in relation to contact or time spent with, as we say in Australia. So applying the principles of the convention, one can determine first which country has jurisdiction to hear the contact dispute, and that's the country of habitual residence, and this is Australia. Then the convention tells you what law <coughs> must the competent authorities, that is the family court here, must apply. So the general principle 
um, is that the competent jurisdiction will apply its domestic law, so that is the family law act. Uh, in terms of, so the matter is going to be heard by the family court, and the family court will take a decision in relation to them time spent with, so how often um, the child is taken back to wherever the father lives for holidays and what are the, the conditions and, and the details. So once this is ordered by the family court, um, say that the other country for convenience, the other contracting country is France or Poland, um, the, because France and Poland are um, contracting states, the decision of the family court of Australia is automatically by operation of law recognized in those countries. There's nothing to do. So sometimes it's just even enough to show the other party in the other country, look, that's the decision, that's the convention, it's recognized. And very often there will be enough for the, the other side to comply with the decision. If not, then well, the decision has to be enforced and through a system of central authorities, um, enforcement under the convention in the other country is also very simple. Um, 